All righty. Uh, let's let's get going. N Niga, do you want to come and, and join us? Hey, Niga, welcome. Hello. Uh, thank you for coming. So uh, we're going to be chatting today about something that, that's pretty kind of near and dear to Niga's heart, uh, which is can customer lifecycle management and specifically like what 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 one of the reasons i really wanted nigga to come on is because i really wanted someone to come and talk with us about b2c customer lifecycle management because i think it's it's a very kind of particular topic and if you know if you've got a consumer facing business and 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 nigga's uh from pet circles well as well as a bunch of other places like i think it's just a topic that that needs needs to go we, i really wanted to go deep on and do some justice too and i saw nigo's presentation out and about and i thought wow okay good to get nigo on to chat to us about this so thank you again for coming and spending time with us um just before we get going so we run this webinar series about Terum. so we're a we're a tech product development and strategy firm we uh love working with enterprise tech companies um, and we, you know, just, I think at the end of the day, we, we love building product. We love talking to people, building product. And it's one of the big reasons as to why we do the, the webinar series with product leaders like Niga, like the former VP of product at Netflix, ho whole bunch of different people, as well as we're doing a CTO series where we're interviewing CTOs from all around Australia. We just love, love sharing what, what Aussies and, and global thought leaders doing around product and, and tech, um, and it's just, it's a big passion of, of mine as well. It's, probably, it's one of my favorite parts of the job, getting this chat to really smart people about really interesting stuff in product. I, I've been involved in 60, like over 61 product launches. Um, pro probably more interesting though, is I do make my own sausages and the, uh, the price of those sausages is significantly more than I could pay at the supermarket when I add up all the ingredients and time spent, but it's a passion of mine and I'm a big sailor as well. Um, now on to, to Niga. So Niga is, is currently in the role of like leading customer lifecycle and growth at Pet Circle. And um, I think what's like, what's fascinating to me in, in getting to know Niga a little bit is like, so Niga was telling me that every single person, you, you've got a young baby at home, uh, three month old, and you've got your son and you've got yourself and your husband and you've all been born in different countries <laughs> yeah is that right yeah yeah we've, is... we've been traveling around and living in different places for a while now that's awesome and and uh so, something else was like understand and you've got just an amazing eclectic background which i think brings must bring a really special perspective to what you do because you've got a finance background a marketing background user experience mm -hmm. like I'd, I'd love to know how that shapes how you think about growth uh it's an interesting one i don't i wouldn't say it was done on purpose because it wasn't um i do have a bit of a wandering eye always looking at what else i could do and i always get excited by new things and i think that's kind of caused my career projection to kind of go all over the place but it's it's really useful because when i think about you know even how we do customer lifestyle care and growth, I can bring in some UX kind of understanding of like qualitatively what customers want, but then I can also talk, think about how that would financially impact the company and kind of have that conversation uh, with the leadership to kind of give them some confidence that we know what we're talking about. We're not going to spend too much money. Uh, so it kind of helps in different direction just to round about uh, what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, a, that's awesome. I definitely know like I, I've, I studied... A business like I did a business degree but I'm a software engineer by background and like having the two together is often a very useful uh yeah it's 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 awesome I'm gonna kind of like hand over to you now I'm gonna do you want to take control of the of yeah. the um of the screen and we're gonna get on to what we're kind of all here to to learn about so yeah I, over to you hopefully you guys can see my screen well can do we can Perfect. see it Perfect. Um, so I'll just get started. Uh, the first slide I had was an introduction, uh, but I think Scott did a very good job. So I'm not going to go through it because I think I'm just not going to be as good. So we'll leave that to Scott and maybe go uh, right to the next one. Um, so basically what I was going to talk about today is customer lifecycle management and what it is. 
Um, it's not a new idea. It's kind of been around for a long time. It's just um, a lot of times it gets a bit lost in translation. It gets deprioritized and kind of having that full focus on it is really what makes it really uh, work for companies. So customer lifecycle management is basically strategy processes and campaigns, tactics that all go together that kind of carry a customer from a complete stranger who doesn't know your product, doesn't know your brand, uh, and kind of takes them through their life cycle as they get more kind of engaged with you as they have more needs uh, until they're kind of flourished into that butterfly and they're loyal and they kind of stay uh, an advocate for your brand. Um, a couple of reasons that this has become more and more interesting in the last few years is uh, we have had, I know we've had in e-commerce and a lot of other companies had, have had a lot of growth in the last few years, uh, but kind of retention and the lifetime value has become the bigger uh, focus for everyone. And customer lifecycle really helps that because you're kind of guiding the customer through their journey. You can make sure they stay engaged. You can kind of have opportunities to send uh, and spend more to them. Uh, the other one we've seen in marketing is cost of acquisition is kind of skyrocketed in the last like five years. And one of the things that customer lifecycle helps is kind of reduce that because you have a very small portion of customers you'll target, but also you don't reacquire customers because you're holding on to them and kind of retaining them. You don't have to keep spending money for the same customer. So it, it kind of just makes everything more efficient. The next one I think that's a little not obvious is prioritizing investment. Um, you'll see when we go through kind of the whole framework and you have everything to look at, it allows the team to kind of look at how many people are in each stage and what is really the effort and cost to get them to the next stage versus the benefit. Um, so it basically gives you a full picture of what are all the opportunities you could have with your customers and really investing in parts that you think are most relevant to your customers and to your business goals instead of trying to do a bit of everything and kind of not doing a really good job. And, and uh, Nigo, is it, is it a, um, uh, what's interesting to me is the cross cutting, like often, you know, you mentioned retention and you've mentioned acquisition. Often these are almost sitting in completely like ones in the marketing team, ones in the, in the product team, uh, ones maybe in the customer success team, like customer, yeah. you know, is that kind of part of the, what you're saying, like having that view is part of the challenge and where does it sit in, in those you know, traditional disciplines, I guess you'd call them. Yeah, I, I think what I've seen most companies, they have acquisition with marketing. Retention is kind of split between customer experience and product team uh, to kind of work on retention and not really having a team that's handling everything head, end to end kind of makes it less efficient. It makes it a bit more confusing for customers. Um, so we'll go through it a bit more when I talk about kind of how we do the strategy. But what I really advocate for is having a team that's focused kind of end to end. Um, so what we do in Pet Circle, we have a very large and accomplished marketing team that's really focused on acquisition. Uh, and we have a cross-functional life cycle team that kind of takes over the moment a customer is acquired and kind of thinks through what that journey looks like for them and maps out every tactic, every campaign that we go through. And it is a cross-functional team, so it doesn't necessarily sit in product or marketing. It has uh, members from product, marketing, tech, design, uh, even some data analysts. So we all kind of come together and work um, together because it, it just requires that. Awesome. Cool. Uh, and the last thing I was going to say, obviously, it is the best customer experience for the customers. Um, now people want to be more and more kind of talked to on an individual level and having kind of a well-established program allows customers to feel like you know them, you know what they want, and you're kind of talking to them at that level, uh, which is really the biggest uh, impact you can have for customers. Cool. Um, I'll quickly go through this one, um, which is called customer lifecycle management strategy. But basically, this is how we think about getting started with customer lifecycle. Um, I think one of the biggest prerequisites is having some shared customer definitions in the business. Um, so for us, for example, it's really easy to compare leads to new customers. Uh, we are e-commerce. If they haven't bought, they're a lead. If they have bought first time, then they're a new customer. But some businesses, they might be more uh, kind of complex. Uh, but what we need is kind of for everyone to agree on what those uh, definitions are before you can actually put this strategy together. Uh, some of the places you might have to do a bit more work is kind of defining a habit. So what is it uh, for a customer to have a habit for your product, come back to it, 
what is a benchmark for share of wallet? Because you can't kind of try to improve these things if you don't know what the benchmark or where your baseline starts. Um, so a lot of these kind of uh, pre-work has to be done that is, you know, just strategy aligning with uh, the rest of the business of kind of what you think each of these places are now for customers uh, and how you're going to define each state of the customer and where you want to get them to. Um, so I'm not going to go through the whole chart, but basically those are some ideas of what are the different states a customer might go through and what you want to do is kind of agree on what those definitions are ahead of time. Uh, the next step I have is really aligning the objectives. Um, even though like customer lifecycle management is good for retention and good for LTV, it's good to know what your business needs from it. Uh, you might decide that all you want is more customers because you're going to raise money and that's all you know, the finance people care about. But you might decide, no, I want to have few customers, but I want them to be super loyal and very high spend. So it's important to kind of decide what those objectives are ahead of time before you kind of go through and create the rest of the strategy. Uh, step three, which is kind of what we're going to talk about most of the rest of the, the presentation is kind of mapping the channels and tactics to each of the stages you have. Uh, so once you kind of know which stages your customers go through and what you care about, you kind of get an idea of which tactics are available to you uh, that work for your customers, that work for your kind of product uh, type, uh, and kind of prioritize after that where you're going to focus on. So once you know all the levers you can pull, uh, really deciding on which levers you want to focus on. Um, the last two steps are really tech foundations and team and processes. Um, tech foundation is where it becomes really interesting, but also complicated sometimes. Um, as you'll see when we talk, a lot of these tactics require really deep knowledge of an individual customer. So it's important to have like all the customer data centralized, accessible to multiple different platforms. You might have multiple marketing platforms kind of accessing and sending messages to a customer. So you want them to be able to see the same data, to be able to target the same segments, uh, have the same messaging across them. So it gets quite interesting and complicated, but it really depends on what you're trying to do uh, kind of from your prioritization. Uh, and for team is absolutely what you were talking about. Uh, having a cross-functional team that doesn't necessarily sit within a given function, but has tools and skill sets it can pull as it requires, um, has been super valuable for us. We've had a customer lifecycle team for about a year and a half. Um, and having that team as a cohesive team that sits together multiple times a week, spends time, understands to that depth has been a game changer uh, and really what has allowed us to kind of put in place some of these strategies. Can I ask you something about customer definitions? I don't know if you want to do it now or just say, Scott, like I'm going to cover that in a second, but like, do you find with getting those definitions, I mean, something that I, that I see a fair bit is um, marketing and product actually have different definitions of customer. How do you... <laughs> <laughs> I should use words. How do you put them together? Like, yeah, what? Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's an interesting one. And for us, it's like marketing, product, customer support has different like ideas of what's a good customer finance might have a different definition of different types of customers. Um, so it actually took us a bit of time, but what we were able to kind of align on was from our kind of company objectives, what mattered. Uh, so we decided based on company objectives, it really matters for us to know what a habit is for a customer. And for Ecom, it's quite simple because what we looked at, we looked at the retention rates and we can literally see where that retention rate breaks and you kind of get that steady retention. Um, and it was based on that data, it was kind of easy to argue uh, what that uh, kind of definition should be and uh, kind so of habits with everyone. You started not actually with like the customer, like, you know, it's like a 20 to 30 year old person no. or you just went, actually, let, let's start with the habit or in, in my product language way, it would be like the job to be done. Let's start with the habit um, or what we're seeing. And then we kind of, you then built, around that and you got everyone to agree on that as the common framework to build from okay yeah exactly and a lot of that work was done actually by our growth team the year before uh what we did was we kind of looked at qualitatively and quantitatively what we had today so what did our customers do today that made us think they are now established a habit uh and kind of extrapolated data to kind of set that as a definition 
and there's a question here from from uh, James who's saying, how important is pairing this with an underpinning financial model? Do the definitions fall out of what's financially important? And I might add something like, or, or like the metrics are important and maybe that's where the habits came in or yeah. Do you want to have it? Yeah. Uh, I mean, financially where it came, it comes in is, is a lot about kind of balancing our customer uh, acquisition costs and lifetime value. Uh, the customer lifetime value is actually where a lot of discussion has been done of how do you actually define that and how do you predict it going into the future. Uh, so as it applies to kind of customer life cycle, we spend a lot of money on retaining customers and we have to justify spending that money. So we'll see when we get to the reactivation step, we talk about you don't want to reactivate everyone. You, want to, you don't want to kind of financially have that output. Uh, so a lot of kind of the definition, not necessarily for habits, but for rescue and reactivation and who gets rescued and reactivated is based on kind of financial outputs of what that costs us and what is the lifetime value that we get out of that customer. And, okay. and there's one here that's a bit pro like related while we're talking about this definition and reconciling things between teams. Atif asks, um, how, do you, how do you balance the friction between marketing and product and i guess you could add finance as well like how, how do you balance that friction and i think there's some of your colleagues like <laughs> i'll just warn you so don't say anything offensive <laughs> hopefully no. no one from finance though but no <laughs> <laughs> no that that's a good point so um we i've been in a very fortunate spot because i am from the product org but i work very closely with our cmo and our marketing team um so what i've been able to do is kind of have sympathy for both sides and understand what the concerns are. Uh, and even when it comes to finance, we do kind of modeling uh, once a, or twice a year. I've been able to kind of see a lot of what the concerns are and where they think, uh, you know, we are going to get into kind of hot water and kind of ahead of time address some of that with our strategy documentation. So how we actually intend to spend money, when do we, you know, cut down when do we kind of go up we have like certain tactics that are more seasonal we do certain reactivations that are like one time uh specific to kind of the outside environment so like a lot of that comes up with experience and a lot of it has also been you know there have been times where it's been questioned and we've been able to kind of go back look at the data justify what we had done that kind of builds that trust ongoing so the next time we want to do it we don't get quite as many questions Awesome. I'll let you keep going. Cool. Um, I have a quick slide here. I'm not going to go through all the words on the slide. I know it's a bit much. Uh, but basically what we're going to see for the next nine slides are the definitions of the nine stages. Um, I'll go through uh, all of them, but I'll focus on the ones that I think are more interesting to have a discussion on. Uh, for each of them, we'll look at some definitions, metrics, best practices. Uh, but yeah, let me know if I need to slow down or speed up on some of them. Um, first one we'll look at is awareness. Um, so this is one that I think the marketing teams are actually doing really well in most companies. Uh, what I've seen is there's a lot of investment on kind of top of the funnel activity to get awareness. Uh, so the goal really at this stage is to get the best impression um, from a customer from that first impression and really show them how you're different. What is the value you bring? How are you better than the competitors and all that? Um, so a lot of kind of what's on this slide will be known to anyone in marketing. Uh, as it applies to lifecycle management, what we focus on a lot is kind of uh, the tech requirements of getting to know customers that are not necessarily locked in and having a strategy for dealing with kind of anonymous users, uh, whether that's, you know, having better landing pages, you want to have a different navigation for them, simplified kind of landing pages. So as it applies to lifecycle management, what we kind of we let the marketing team deal with getting all the impressions, the brand awareness, content out there, everything. What we kind of look at is if some of these customers that become leads, we need to retarget them. We try to understand as much as possible. So where did they sign up from? What was their channel source? Um, if it came from a specific product line, uh, then we kind of use that information to kind of move them to the next stage. But otherwise, the marketing teams are usually very strong on all the tactics in this space. Um, I'll also go through discovery a bit quicker. So discovery is kind of where um, both product and marketing work a lot on, and that's really getting the customer to that first uh, um, kind of transaction. What we start here is with uh, 
you know, a customer that kind of knows who you are, may have signed up for, you know, uh, your emails, may have, you know, come to the website multiple times. But really what makes this discovery stay stick is kind of taking them from that lead and making them a first time customer. Um, in our context, obviously being a e-commerce is that's a transaction. Um, you know, in other commerces, it might be signing up for services, you know, subscription. Um, so basically what we try to do in this stage is make it as easy as possible for them to make that first um, kind of transaction. Uh, a lot of what we do in this space is to do with social proof. A lot of best practices is to kind of show them, you know, there were other customers that had similar needs to you, uh, wanted a similar thing, and look at how well we've done, whether that's customer reviews, awards, uh, ratings. Uh, and we also try to kind of do uh, conversion rate optimization. So if they are on site, we try to kind of keep them going into kind of the website funnel, get them to that final goal. Uh, and we also call out support a lot. So if you're having trouble signing up, creating an account, setting up payments, as much as you can kind of support that first transaction to make it as easy and painless for a customer to kind of become that first time customer. Um, that's really our goal. As far as KPIs go, we kind of look at percentage of leads acquired. So uh, if we have people who have signed up uh, and you kind of, we start talking to them and trying to get them to make that first transaction, uh, and also new customer conversion rate on site um, to see if all the customers that come new, if they actually make that first transaction. Um, as far as requirements and advanced tactics go, uh, requirements is really, again, more tracking and getting that often. Uh, a lot of kind of the channels you have that are owned like uh, email and SMS depend on that often. So what we want to do is get that often so we can then start talking more to a customer and show them value. Um, and obviously word of mouth uh, strategy and referral programs are super important at this stage because most customers join because they know someone else who said something good about your business. So we try to keep that really positive for them. Uh, next stage we'll look at is onboarding. And this is one that I kind of want to spend a bit more time on because I think people generally under value and invest in. Um, onboarding is really the foundation to uh, getting engagement, getting loyalty, to uh, getting a better lifetime value and retention out of the customers. And I like that uh, kind of uh, bridge on the right because it's really uh, kind of pinpoints that idea of that onboarding is like a bridge. It takes a first time customer who may or may not be super you know, into your brand and takes them and becomes a repeat customer who knows your brand, understands what the value is, and kind of wants to be more engaged with your product. Uh, and onboarding has become super important in the last few years as kind of customers have become more motivated to go and find the products they need. Product-led growth has become huge. So it's really important to kind of have that hand-holding uh, the first few times they're kind of um, coming to your product, giving them an amazing experience the first few times until they get to that habit moment that we already talked about. Um, it's interesting you define it as not just um, like, or I can hear what you're saying at least, and I'm just kind of clarifying is like the, it's not just that first purchase in e-com or, or in, in consumer, it's not, not just the first purchase, but it's actually, it sounds like multiple kind of experiences in order to bridge to being a repeat customer and you view onboarding as being, across those experiences not just because sometimes onboarding is taken as like okay they just signed up and it's like the next 10 minutes of them you know activating their account properly or something and making a purchase you're saying no no it's actually a bit more than that is that is that right oh yeah absolutely uh so for us what we do is uh we kind of map out all the steps a customer needs to go until they reach a habit and in our business a habit is three transactions um, three transactions in our context could take three months. Uh, so we kind of map out every stage they need to go through. Maybe they need to come to your website four times in that three months. Maybe they need to kind of read an article. They need to open multiple emails. So we kind of figure out what all these steps are. And we try to burn, uh, kind of build a program that pushes them from one step to another to kind of keep them more engaged and keep them going down that path. Uh, one of the things that I like, uh, which kind of that's, uh, graph shows under right is kind of what we do is we map a site framework. So it basically looks at from the moment a customer kind of comes in contact with you 
they're very excited. They're, you know, obviously setting up for something new. They have like a positive psych, so they're kind of going in a positive direction. And we identify places where maybe that is kind of starting to taper off their excitement for your product. Maybe it's been too long since they remembered you. Kind of as it that starts tapering off, do we then kind of add motivational boosts, whether that's, you know, come back to us, we miss you, here's a coupon, uh, here's a contest, whatever it is that you can kind of get the customer back engaged. And we kind of try to map that to the journey that the customer takes from that first transactions until they get to the habit. And that could be months and it could be multiple, multiple touch points. Yeah, One awesome. of the other yeah, one of the other things I think is very important in onboarding that people sometimes uh, may forget is that it is quite a hard decision and it's it's a hard time whenever you start something new. Um, so it's really important to make it easy and enjoyable for a customer to go through onboarding. Uh, so we see a lot of companies use, for example, progress bars or a little contest at the beginning and leaderboards to kind of just get that kind of first couple of experiences a bit more interesting. Uh, one of the things I like is progressive profiling, which we could talk about in details if you guys want, but basically not asking for everything at the beginning and make a customer fill up like 50 fields. Um, if you really don't need something for the next few touch points to kind of leave that for later on and kind of get the customer just going and having a positive experience into the product uh, and not trying to get them everything from them at the same time. Um, in our context, I think one of the things we've kind of decided to do now is um, before we used to, you know, get a new customer, we sell, let's say, dog food on subscription. We'd be like, buy your dog, food, buy your toys, and buy your treats, and also add up, uh, sign up for our subscription, and also read some article. It's just too much. It's I'm already finished. overwhelmed. By <laughs> <it>. <laughs> I just wanted some dog food. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's what it is. Like customers want to be kind of walk through that journey and like asking them only for one thing. What is that one thing you need them to do now? and not kind of piling on top of it. Um, so right now what we do is whatever you buy, we just ask you to buy it again. We don't try to sell you anything new while you haven't had a habit. We don't try to get you into the subscription program. We just try to get you to do what you have been comfortable with one more time. Um, and that kind of helps a lot with getting people through the onboarding. Um, Next stage we'll look at is engagement. Um, and I think this is an interesting stage because this is where most of the customers will be. And this is the stage they probably spend most of their time on. Um, they kind of go through onboarding quickly. Hopefully they don't churn and they kind of stay in this engaged uh, period for a long time. And what's really important at this point is to kind of communicate to them regularly, be relevant, um, show them that you know who they are. Uh, and kind of maintain that habit that they have, whether it's, you know, a frequency habit that they buy or come back to your site at like certain amount of time, or it's a depth of spend or usage, like they use certain features from your product three times a week, kind of understanding what is that engagement uh, for them and try to continue to add value and kind of deepen the relationship without trying to push them out of their habit uh, and kind of keeping them in that habit. Uh, the KPI we use mostly for this is kind of retention rate. Again, that's kind of a cop out because retention rate really depends on the business and what it means for your business. Yeah, it's, Our, a, bit, it's a bit of a like lagging indicator, right? It's like the retention rate is a result of other things exactly. that you have done. Yeah, exactly. And that's that can be said for all of engagement. Um, it's really a combination of all the experiences they've had until that moment with you. Um, how they feel about the brand, how kind of their preferences have been taken into account. So one of the things that's most important to show them is that you understand who they are, you know what they want from your kind of product, and you can personalize their experience to them. Uh, so a lot of the tactics, for example, as an e-commerce, we do, we do kind of regular sales and promos, but we also do like personalized reminders. So um, if you come to the site and you leave something in your cart, we send you a personalized abandoned cart. Or if you are buying something regularly, we kind of send you a reminder that says your dog food is running out, it's time to buy. Uh, to kind of keep that kind of conversation going, showing them that we know who they are, um, kind of doing anything that adds value to them as excitement kind of keeps you top of mind. Those are really the tactics to kind of go through from uh, through engagement. Um, and really what matters here is 
there's a lot you can do with data in this stage because you start getting really a lot of data for each customer, uh, kind of modeling what kind of recommendations you can make for them, uh, what kind of predictions you can have for where they go next in their stages and kind of getting them there. But the most important thing is just to show them you care um, and that you appreciate that they've been a loyal customer so far and they're being engaged. Um, next stage we'll look at is growth. And this is really where businesses um, try to get uh, their business objectives uh, from the customer. So, uh, you know, customers engaged, but now we want to sell more to them. Uh, we want them to buy more often. We want them to buy more of something. Uh, so we basically are increasing customer engagement, but we're also doing it in the context of spending more uh, with the company. Um, so in terms of KPIs go, we usually look at percentage revenue increase per cohort, uh, share of wallet, uh, anything that kind of engages that kind of spending more. Um, and the winning strategies here are a few. So you, you can have vertical or horizontal category adoption or uh, future expansion. You can have an increased frequency or increase in spend. Um, how, how do you balance the, say, like, you know, so say you've invested a lot in onboarding, you've invested a lot in engagement and you've got people kind of making their purchases, you're getting them in the habit. But then something that I think um, I see a lot, especially with fast scaling tech companies, is there's a big focus on growth and you can really damage the other two. How do you find that balance in your Absolutely. view? Absolutely. I think one of the places where, we've started being really good at is one protecting the customer at the beginning of their journey. So as we talked about before they set a habit, we don't start asking for too many things. Uh, and even after that, having kind of a, a journey map of what we want them to do at different stages. So um, going and asking them to do 10 things at once is just not reasonable. It will hurt your word of mouth. The customer yeah. will get turned off and they're just gone. Um, and a lot of what we do, for this growth stage is kind of within the context. So um, having that context and understanding of customers is super important. So for us, we sell pet products. I can't sell more dog food to your dog. Like it only eats a certain amount. Yeah, I was gonna, uh, yeah, cause I, <laughs> the, yeah, and how, so is that how you kind of, uh, I'm guessing, and I'm just like, yeah, can, can you, you're putting the boundaries around it like, like that, using your journey map of what you want them to do each stage but then putting some constraints on it too, by the sound of it, and just saying like, hey, it's not reasonable for us to try and sell. Like I've got a, I've got a Maltese Shih Tzu, like a small, a small dog, like, you know, it doesn't eat very much food. Like I can't, <laughs> exactly. like I can't give it more. <laughs> exactly. That's where the context becomes really important. So for our context, exactly. I can't get you to buy more food. Uh, I could get you to buy better food, which is what we do upselling to kind of understand get customers to understand what a better food might be. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, but I could also maybe sell you other things, which is where we have the ver vertical kind of category expansion. Why, why don't you buy your dog toys from us or dog treats from us, uh, even if it's like a dog bed from us? And that's kind of where we focus a lot of our uh, attention on like cross sales and bundling. And mm. we've seen amazing results in our retention rate. So like we basically see retention rate of like, if you buy one category, it's here. If you buy two categories, it's definitely higher. Even if that category is something you buy once. If you buy like a dog bed from us once and you never buy that category again, the fact that you bought that second category increases retention to rate and lifetime value. And are you using um, like, do, how do you think about measuring that you're going in the wrong direction? Like, do you measure if you, okay, we introduced this bundle like or a particular offer or something and, you know, do you go, or oh, hold on, it's now sent retention backwards. Or what? What? What numbers are you paying attention to to know if the experiment you're doing is not not working? Yeah, um, I think a lot of our experiments we use are leading indicators, so we don't necessarily get to that retention rate. Yeah. What we look at is kind of engagement and whether they took off the bundle. So if we had a new bundle, how much of that bundle? We usually have multiple versions of anything, anyways. Yep. And we kind of try to understand uh, what we're getting more and what we're getting less. And I think what we're very fortunate in our business is that we have vets on staff who are experts in this space. So they can tell you exactly what to bundle with what. So that's having kind of that context of uh, background. We don't just put any two random products together. 
they can tell you exactly what the needs of a uh, you know dog will be that will have this product. So what is the best you know product to sell with it? Uh, and a lot of our bundles are actually kind of created that way, not based on kind of data or margin or kind of what the company wants to sell. Well, what's the most counterintuitive result you've had on that? <laughs> you know, the, the, those <laughs> results where you're like, "What? That shouldn't <laughs> that shouldn't have worked? Or why didn't that one work?" Yeah, it, it, it's an interesting one. So if we look at data, it almost doesn't make sense. Um, so if you look at for cats, for example, every product has high uh, kind of usage with litter because they all buy litter. So every category you sell, it always tells you the next category uh, you should sell yes, is it, litter. Yeah, yeah, it's like a, it's a trap. If you go, oh yeah, we should upset. Well, no, it's not really changing the custom. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Or like uh, for dogs, what we see is a lot of uh, customers are cross kind of feeding with two different flavors of the same brand. So they have like high correlations together, but you're not really selling anything different to them. They will kind of switch that brand uh, yeah, or yeah, yeah, kind yeah. of flavor yeah. all the time. Yeah. Um, so that's why it's so important not to be 100% on data. It kind of makes you look yeah. a bit stupid. Uh, <laughs> having that like kind of context of how people are using the products and kind of what to kind of recommend to them has been very important. Yeah, cool. I'll let you keep going. Um, so the next one we have is rescue. Uh, and this is one that I think a lot of companies don't do. Um, it's a stage that if you look at some of the other frameworks, it's usually not in those frameworks, but I think it's super important. And the way we describe rescue is we're basically reestablishing um, a habit when we see a customer is falling off of it. Um, so both rescue and reactivation are not linear paths in a customer journey. We only get to them where something has gone wrong. Um, and the rescue is very important because it is kind of what it does is it looks at the consistent engagement that the customer has and sees if they've fallen off and we kind of react to it. So if you used to buy every eight weeks, it's been nine weeks and you haven't bought, we think something has gone wrong. Um, and a very important thing about rescue is really time sensitive. So the sooner we get people back under their habit, the easier it is and the longer they stay on it. Uh, so that's why we don't kind of wait for you to lapse and then reactivate you. We kind of have this rescue stage in between where we try to kind of reestablish um, the habit that you may have lost. Um, well, there's a there's a good question just around this this rescue and uh, growth incentive thing, um, we, we, which is from Phil, which is how do you balance um, in in the nature of because some of Pet Circle's products are I'm a happy Pet Circle customer like some of Pet Circle's products are vet like vet style products that are around health and everything. How do you balance the question from Phil is how do you balance the com commercial imperative to upsell like higher end food, maybe even high margin products that aren't as good with the vet, like, you know, the vet health option. Um, yeah. How, and how do customers think about it? Yeah. So we have uh, certain principles and it's not a customer life cycle principle. It's more of a business principles. Um, and our principles actually put the customer and the pet's needs above kind of the commercials. Um, so any of our uh, kind of recommendations, whether it's on site or in our emails or in our customer lifecycle journeys, they are not based on margin. They're always based on what the pets should have. Uh, we don't make medical kind of recommendations, but we always kind of try to make the best suited uh, for customers. So we do have brands that are very low in margin, but are very high quality and they get recommended quite often. Uh, and one of the things we have is actually all our recommendations are backed by the vets. Uh, and because of their kind of reputation, uh, they are very careful to not kind of back anything that's margin centered specifically. Yeah, interesting. So you, you, you've you got this, even though we've been talking a lot about like hard metrics to you, like what's going to get us the best growth rate or something, you then over, overlay on top of that, well, no, we can't consider this one because of yes. it's not that's not good for the pet. Yeah, super interesting. Yeah, we, we roughly say we're a pet company. We're not an e-commerce company. Um, and that's kind of has kind of gone down through the ranks and everybody keeps that in mind. Um, so a lot of times, yeah, when we are building campaigns, we always build it for what's best for the pets versus kind of looking at a specific margin target. Um, so the thing about rescue that I wanted to kind of talk about is, um, 
again, it kind of gets back to the financials too, is to kind of really understand the reason for why a customer has become disengaged. Uh, because what we look at is kind of voluntary and involuntary disengagement. Uh, and what we say is when a customer is involuntarily disengaged, uh, we kind of don't want to go uh, and try to rescue them. Uh, this well, That basically means like the need they had has changed. They no longer have a need for your product. Um, maybe what they were using the product for was not the perfect solution. And now they have found the perfect solution. So they no longer need you. Um, in our case, it could be, unfortunately, your pet has passed away. Uh, there's no point for me to try to kind of uh, send you more emails to buy something because you no longer have that pet. And it's really important to kind of differentiate it that between that and voluntary. And voluntary is basically when something has gone wrong and the customer has decided that they no longer want your business. And that's really where we go with rescue after. So we do a lot of kind of qualitative uh, under, uh, kind of studies to understand what are the reasons that people are turning. And we basically try to fix things. Uh, I mean, we have certain kind of rescue tactics that are, you know, emails that go out and, you know, that will sit within the lifecycle team that's kind of try to rescue with incentives. But I think the biggest part of rescue is trying to fix what has been done wrong. Um, and a lot of that can be done even by our customer support. Like somebody had a bad experience, uh, they make up for it. They're like free returns, uh, you know, free kind of delivery, whatever you can do to kind of... Um, undo the harm that may have been done to a customer i'd love to know if i was classified as voluntary or in involuntary rescue when i couldn't remember my password and wanted to reorder but <laughs> exactly. couldn't for a couple of months like it, it was involuntary but it was more like incompetence or busyness or whatever you want to call it on I, my I, part. yeah and i kept going I, to log in and reorder. i was like oh i can't remember <laughs> sounds I, like it shouldn't be that hard and it's not like i'm not you know, like can't operate a password reset function, but I just, I was battling with it emotionally to do it. <laughs> and, and that's that's a perfect example that every rescue effort is not necessarily, you know, an email that goes out, sometimes just making it easier for people to come back um, and kind of maybe reset their password. That yeah. could be a part of kind of what is kind of classified under rescue. Um, for this one, it, it, it takes a little bit kind of, to get a hang of, it requires a bit more modeling. Uh, for our use case, we have a natural frequency model that kind of looks at how often people need something. Uh, and we kind of know when they've fallen off means they've gone and kind of fulfilled the need somewhere else. Um, it does, we do case studies, we do kind of MPS tracking, uh, all to kind of get an idea of kind of where our customers are and who's kind of fallen off the way. Um, and some of the best ways to do rescue are just not scalable. Does, does um, NPS, um, I actually, sorry, that's interesting. I want, I just want to let you finish that thought. Some of the best things are not scalable. Yeah. Some of the best ways to do rescue are things that are expensive, but if you think that customer is worth it, uh, it's worth going out after, um, like we used to do outbound calls. We used to actually call a customer and be like, why did you cancel your subscription? What went wrong? Uh, kind of have that conversation and be like, maybe you can't reset your password. Let me help you. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's more being kind of holistic with how we think about rescue. It's, it, it also seems somewhat, um, like it, it doesn't scale, but then it kind of does. Uh, I feel like when you see it done well, it ends up scaling. Cause then people, I've had experiences like that where they fix it up and they, you, you fix it up so well that you then tell everyone about like, I was really good. There was a problem. And then, you know, they just sorted it out. And it was so good. And now I'm like super happy about it. So it can become, I, I really wanted to ask you just um, that, cause that's a really interesting point. I wanted to ask you about NPS and NPS's relationship with anything useful. Um, is, is, is it useful in like understanding if someone needs to be rescued or is it only useful in understanding who your advocates are? I don't think NPS on its own as a one-time metric is useful. I'm yeah. not the biggest fan of it. Uh, what I do like is tracking NPS over time. So if for a customer that used to give you a seven, it doesn't matter what seven means. But if they suddenly give you a five, that's a downward trend. It yeah. kind of doesn't matter where they start. It's more about how that trend goes up and down that we kind of look at it. Because I, if I get an NPS from a company I'm not happy with, I delete the email 
like or not responding my, to you know, it that's my, yeah. <laughs> yeah i'm like well, uh, anyway uh, uh, nps it's a fascinating one for me because i know um a lot of venture capitalists pay a t- lot of attention to it I, I understand it's got like yes it has some value and it's interesting what you say that the one to you is the trend not necessarily the number itself yep. so yeah cool i'll let you keep going i'll go I'm, a bit quicker yeah, and we got about we got about five minutes. So you and then we we want to have a bit of time for Q and A. Yeah. So I have three more, so I'll go for the uh, awesome. quickly through them. Uh, so reactivation is basically the next stage from rescue. Uh, you weren't allow, uh, able to kind of rescue a customer, and they've gotten to a point that they've lost their habit. Uh, really, your uh, kind of goal here is to re-engage a customer and take them back to where they were. And what I wanted to kind of show with the right hand side is really important to understand where they were before they lapsed. So if a customer was before they kind of reached that habit moment, it's important to re-onboard them uh, versus try to reactivate them because they haven't really experienced the product to the full and understand the value of it, which is a very different approach to someone who has been engaged for a while and has now become disengaged, which you would do reactivation on. Um, So I think that's one really important point about reactivation. And the other one I want to make sure uh, is that not everybody should be reactivated. So if you lost a thousand customers, it doesn't necessarily mean that you should go and try to reactivate a thousand customers. One is very costly, but it also can create kind of other negative effects. If you keep like emailing them, your deliverability can go down. Your you might annoy people, and the word of mouth will get affected. So it's really important to focus only on customers you want to activate. Um, so one of the things we look at is we look at like a predictive lifetime value should be more than the cost of us to reactivate them. We want to make sure they were a good uh, kind of fit for the first uh, time and they haven't churned over and over again um, because that kind of shows that maybe we're not the right product for them. We're just kind of forcing it through. Um, And lastly, we kind of try to see if they would reactivate on their own. Uh, So we hit them once. We kind of wait to see if they would reactivate naturally to kind of reduce that cost burden on us uh, kind of paying for any incentives to reactivate. It's really interesting the um, who you're not going to serve as well because you can end up building yeah like you've said campaigns emails product features to try and reactivate or recover someone but then if they're not who you want like you also then compromise your experience for all of your actual customers that are very happy like paying you and loving what you're doing what you're doing and would want to spend more it's just it's really really good point yeah um as far as tactics and uh, go, I think they're pretty uh, well known. We do like incentivize reactivations, uh, but also kind of it depends on the lifetime value. There's a lot of modeling you could do on that side and kind of targeting roles. Uh, we can come back to it in Q&A uh, if anyone's interested. Um, just going to loyalty next. Obviously, loyalty is when you become the obvious choice for the customer. They never have to think about it. You're on top of their mind. Uh, a lot of what we look at in this space is kind of looking at satisfaction. Uh, I think the most important thing for loyalty is to have a really good experience throughout. You don't necessarily need a loyalty program to have loyal customers. If your experience is consistently really positive, people just naturally become loyal. Uh, on top of that, there are other tactics. Obviously, there's loyalty programs. We use a subscription program. Um, anything you can do that kind of keeps customers engaged, shows them that you care. Uh, that they are a loyal customer to the view and you kind of appreciate them uh, really helps in this uh, kind of area. And it's one of those other ones where you need a lot of data and kind of centralized data so your other systems can see that this is a loyal customer and, for example, support can give them a VIP treatment. They can have like faster delivery or whatever it is, as long as you can kind of identify Wait, what have I got to like. What have I got to do to get bumped up into the pet circle <laughs> VIP? I'll, I'll tell you after the call. <laughs> tell me the exact <laughs> the exact metrics I've got to hit in my usage, and I'll no. <laughs> maybe after the call. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you. I'll let you keep going. Um, so basically, that's that's the one with loyalty. I think the most important thing, though, is the customer kind of experience um, at every stage, as long as they're fully satisfied, it doesn't necessarily need some of these like more fancy programs. And the last stage we're going to go through is advocacy. So this is basically where customers go out and just tell everyone how great you are. Uh, and there's a lot of research that shows people kind of buy more from their, when they're at, like with kind of a referral from a friend or family. Um, and from a business perspective, these are really cheap acquisition channel. 
because you're spending no money on it. And the leads that come from these channels are high intense. Again, they've been told by friends and family they trust. Uh, so are a lot more likely to kind of come back and make that first purchase. Um, other than that, uh, we can do kind of referral bonuses that requires its own uh, program uh, and kind of a strong word of mouth overall uh, is always useful. Uh, there's a couple of different kinds of referrals, but we don't have to kind of get into that kind of detail um, unless it comes out in QAs. What are, what are your just views on on referrals? Like, should you incentivize them or should you do other things to encourage them where you're not adding a monetary? Like, should it be intrinsic or extrinsic? It, it kind of depends. So there is like the kind of demonstration advocacy where you kind of, the customer shows how good the product is by using it and other people seeing it. Uh, if it's kind of built into the product itself, I think that's a lot stronger. Uh, for something like e-commerce, it's not necessarily built into the product unless when you get the box, you know, at your door, it says, you know, the brand on it and you see and kind of identify mm -hmm. with that. Um, for our case, kind of, we do incentivize referrals because in e-commerce, it's a very common thing. Uh, customers actually enjoy getting that um, kind of bonus back and kind of sharing it with more customers. Uh, it depends on the context, I think, a lot. Uh, we never incentivize reviews. We never say, you know, go and give us five stars and we give you $10. That's not something we do. We do incentivize customers to tell your friends or family what you think of our product and if they, you think they should buy from us. Yeah, we've got um, we've got some Q and A questions. If you, I think, if you got a little bit more to go through, or uh, no, I have one more final one, slide. Do you want to... no. cool. uh, yeah, this bunch of topics and yeah, I basically what I was gonna say is this is all based on a series I was writing, and this is the first two parts. There are another few parts that I'm working on. Um, if anyone wants to read it. You can please um of... please make sure you share it with us because like we'd love to share, share it with everyone as, as well as they come as they come through um let me okay. let me um all right so we've got a question here from uh a tiff um i'm just going to grab the screen off you yep. we've got a question from a tiff which says uh at what stage of business and i should say if you've got questions pop them in the Q&A window, pop them in the chat. Uh, we've got one here from Atif and we're just going to go through them and we've got about five five or so minutes to, to cover a couple. I, I've certainly got some. Um, so Atif says, at what stage of business should one prioritize acquisition and one should and when should one prioritize retention? Which I, which is a, like, it's a really good question. How, how do you think about which one of those steps do you, do you prioritize? Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. I think at the beginning, everyone, you know, rightfully starts with acquisition. And that's kind of where you start getting um, a lot of new customers. What we see is usually uh, companies get to a point that that customer acquisition cost starts to really go up. Uh, and it gets to a point that you kind of start seeing that retention is a lot cheaper than acquisition. So if you looked at the lifetime value of the customers you have existing and compare that to what the cost of acquiring a new customer will be, you kind of start seeing those lines kind of cost um, once you have an existing base and realize that, you know, for every customer that you lose, it's a lot more expensive to gain one. And that's kind of where a lot of companies start switching, going from, you know, spending a lot of money on acquisition to building a program uh, to kind of retain and engage customers. Very Does it question. change over time? Do you kind of like end up, you know, overdoing it in one area and then coming back to another? Do you kind of sit down and look and prioritize and say, well, this area right now needs our focus. You do a bit there and then you say, okay, we're going to go balance it up and put some more into re rescue or. Yeah. I mean, for sure. Uh, a lot of what we saw at the beginning of COVID is we got huge numbers of new customers. Um, and for the first bit is like, keep the floodgates open and let it all come in. Uh, but then you get to like, okay, now we need to move these people through the series. And that's kind of where a lot of that prioritization comes on. When you have the model set up and the definition set up, you can actually see how many people fall into each stage. And you can really see them kind of go from stage to stage and identify what is the stage that has the highest opportunity for you now uh, to kind of invest a lot into that. And once they go to the next stage, see if that's the next stage that you need to work on. Uh, to, but yeah. to be... Um even more specific, like just to like really get inside how you think about it 
in your backlog at the moment for the team's like current month or sprint? Yeah. Is it like heavy one aspect or is it spread across the the group or? I think right now we are mostly focused on the growth stage. Uh, but last year when we first started the uh, team, we started with onboarding. Yeah, uh, cool. We kind of wanted to get that first step. We did a lot on onboarding and then we moved kind of to engagement. Uh, now a lot of the focus is on growth and referrals because those are the ones that were kind of not focused on last year. And we're kind of getting to that stage where we have a lot of engaged customers that we're trying to grow and get advocates out of it. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much for that one. And then we've got another question here from James, which says, do you consider discrete reacquisition channels? And do you have a cost of reacquisition per customer per channel? Or is reacquisition really a set of actions in one channel? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure about the last part. Uh... But basically, the way we think of reacquisition is it, it does go into our overall cost of acquisition and it uh, kind of affects our CPAs. Um, so what we look at is we try everything to do to obviously engage the customers and keep them retained. Uh, the customers that have been disengaged for a certain amount of time, we do consider them for reacquisition because saying that we would reactivate the customers three years later is kind of not right we're not the business we were three years ago when they used to be our customers their needs has probably changed a lot so in that case we actually start looking at something like reacquisition we don't necessarily target a specific channel to it uh we do kind of target a lot of our reactivations through email uh but as far as react reacquisition re goes we're basically wherever they come from so if they come through sem or seo uh, we just acquire them wherever we see them and just, just to follow on from this question, because it's a question um, that I was chatting to someone about like the other day, which is um, what, what's your views on micro segmentation? Yeah, it, it, it depends, I think, on the context a lot. Um, so the way we look at, I kind of look at it from a spectrum of like segmentation to personalization. And we don't necessarily have to have everything personalized one-to-one -one, and we don't try to have everything on a segmentation kind of basis. It really depends. So when we send, for example, sales, we only send it to four or five different segments. That's how we segment our customers. But when I send out something like the rescue or reactivation, we go all the way to personalize the message, the kind of what they used to buy, what kind of products recommendations are on. So it kind of is a bit of a spectrum. Yeah, um, onboarding is a good example of it's kind of in between it's not three segments it's a lot more segments it depends on what pet type what category they were buying for so we kind of keep that in mind depending on kind of campaign by campaign yeah yeah and and we've got a question here from kevin that says we're trying to transition from a large e-commerce business provider named after a rainforest uh, that keeps a tight rein on the customer data we don't know who, i I couldn't tell you who that is. Uh, we, we went with them because customer acquisition cost is cheap and simple logistics. Now we're trying to break up with them and get our customers back. Any tips? Yeah, I, I think that's kind of one of the biggest concerns with using those kind of partners is that really who owns the customers? If you're not uh, able to communicate with them directly, it's really hard to get a customer to kind of stay with you engaged and kind of take you off as you go off platform. Um, what I would say is if there is any ways you can kind of engage them off of the website and the platform itself, where you can have them um, kind of either retargeted on social or on emails, if you can kind of take them out of that platform and build enough valuable content so they kind of come and to you more than the platform before you kind of make the complete switch so you don't lose everyone. And uh, we probably one last question because we've run run a little bit over. We've got one last. I didn't get to ask any of my questions this time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we got one from Phil, which says the online pet retail market seems to be getting more competitive and offer slash price driven. Um, what what are the factors that drive engage? It's really interesting. And you can almost think more broadly with e-com, but you know, when you've got a competitive online uh, marketplace. Yeah, what, what do you do to drive engagement and loyalty? Is yes. it the, the sum of your life cycle activities that go beyond that? Is it something else? Or 
Yeah, it's, it's a lot to do with our life cycle activities, but I can't take full credit for it. A lot of our engagement comes from the product experience. For example, for e com next day delivery has become an expectation and very important to customers. So even though it's not necessarily something that my team will work on, it is hugely important to retention. Same thing for customer support. Having a really strong customer support enables a lot of more retention than yeah, kind of yeah. sending an email to someone who may or may not open it. So it's kind of customer retention becomes a goal for cross-functional around the business. That's when yeah. you really see the best results. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's I get just something take away from that. For me that I think is worth pulling out of what you said is, or is implied in what you said is like, not all the answers for this are going to can see it within mm. the, your team. You might identify something and say, hey, like we think we can retain more people if we do same day delivery. But your team can't. Exactly. Like we're a bunch of tech guys. <laughs> we're, we're, not, <laughs> we're not logistics people. Let's be honest. Yeah. It's like, you know, someone's got to fulfill on that. And that's a serious operation trying to fulfill on that at the scale you guys are at. So look, we, yeah. we run a little bit over. So thank you so much for staying with us. Sure. Thanks for everyone that asked the question. It's always good having an awesome discussion, but I think that, that that's been awesome, Nega. Thank you so much for your, sure. for your time. And I just want to say like, if you, if for those in the audience, those that are doing the, the replay, if you've loved kind of what we've been going through, you can watch it again. You'll get an email. Um, you, yeah, you can watch the replay. We will send out an email with, with um, the slides and the content that you can look at uh, as well as like Nega's socials. You can, you can follow her and, and read along as she she writes more about this topic but look thank you so much for having us um nega and and thank you everyone for joining us thank you for having me See you later.